Our scripture reading comes from, if I can get everything situated in my hand here, um, John chapter 15, 13 through 17. No one shows greater love than when he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do not, if you do what I command you, I don't call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my father. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I have appointed you to go and produce fruit that will last so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word. I'm always blessed when Sister Carol Lee speaks. And I'm looking forward to this as well. Um, and I'm sure you will as well. So um, keep a prayer in your heart and your ears open because I'm sure the Lord will bless us this morning. Sister Carol Lee. Good morning again. Let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, please be with our service today. Please help the words that I'm going to speak to help us to think about our lives and to think about our witness to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Once while he was preaching, a pastor raised his eye and what he saw upstairs came as a great surprise. Amazed and almost paralyzed, he saw his only son leaning over the balcony and having barrels of fun. The boy was pelting listers sitting down below with beans from his bean shooter, and it was quite a show. The father stopped his preaching and tried to catch his breath. The youngster spied his father's eyes. The place was still as death. He shouted clearly to his dad, nor feared the course he'd take. You go on a preaching, Pop. I'll keep them all awake. <laughs> now this little ditty really doesn't have anything to do with my talk this morning. I don't consider myself a preacher, nor this a sermon. But I love poetry. And I love the poet who wrote this. His name was Adelaide Albert Estab and he was the head of the home missionary department of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, where my mother was a secretary. My parents had recently separated, and mom had to get a job. She borrowed enough money to take a six-month secretarial course at a secretarial school and applied to the General Conference for a job, and she was hired in the home missionary department. And Elder Esteb was an angel. He took mother aside and us, our little family, and encouraged us and helped us in many ways. He kind of took my little brother as a project and made him feel special. Now, everyone expects people who work at the General Conference to be good, to be saints, but this man really was. And I used to look forward every time he was preaching in Sabbath because whenever he preached, He'd have poems like this throughout his sermon. And as a teenager, church wasn't always all that interesting. But when Elder Esteb preached, because I knew him, and I knew the kind of man he was, his words made a big difference. Now, when I first started speaking occasionally in church, and it's still not my favorite thing to do, I would ask my granddaughters when they were small, what would you like grandma to talk about? Their only request was that I didn't talk too much. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep that in mind today, even though the girls are grown and gone. I think most of you know that I love to watch birds from my screened in porch. It's a favorite pastime of mine when I have some downtime and I find it relaxing and refreshing. I'm often found out on the porch with my little dog, Peppy, watching the birds. 
In fact, Peppy knows what I say. Let's go see the birdie. She heads for the door, jumps up on the couch, is ready to cuddle and watch my feathered friends. But today my talk isn't about birds for change, but about another hobby that I have, and that's houseplants. Now, I'm probably the most unlikely person genetically to get into growing things. I do not remember a single houseplant growing up anywhere in my home or in my grandmother's home. The closest thing I can remember was an avocado seed stuck in a jar of water with toothpicks to the side in grandma's kitchen window. I don't remember whether it ever grew. One year, uh, my uncle from Florida sent me what I was considered a rather strange gift. It was a box of dirt with one bean seed and instructions to water it. I wasn't impressed. I watered it. It grew. It got tall. It wasn't very pretty. I have a feeling that mother threw it out. Mother did not tolerate dirt or clutter. So I think that the bean seed was pretty much history. But anyway, eventually I decided to grow some iris bulbs in the yard. I had some iris and some coleus and some marigolds and I was really quite proud of my 13 year old self. When mother moved to Hendersonville, she had beautiful tulips adorning her window boxes. They were lovely in the spring they were lovely in the summer. They were beautiful in the fall. And in the winter, they graced her window boxes covered with snow. They were plastic. <laughs> <laughs> but they were beautiful. So gardening was not in my blood. Now, I grew up and became busy with my life. And I didn't really think about plants for many years. When I married Billy, I discovered that his mother was a plant guru and could grow anything. And my daughter's yards attest to it. Missy has the biggest gardenia bush I've ever seen in my life. And her grandma planted bushes and trees all over the property, and the same thing for Tammy. She could take a stick, put it in the sand, stick a mason jar over it, she had a tree. And if you admired one, she'd give you a cutting. She was very, very good at that. She was, didn't have any houseplants though, not a one. But she did have tea roses. She loved, for, loved her tea roses, her English tea roses, and she tended them lovingly. She and Dr. Jakes, another member of our church, had a friendly competition about who could bring the prettiest roses to church. And during those years, I don't think we ever had an artificial plant in our church service. When roses weren't in season, Dr. Jakes, who had a small greenhouse, would bring other living plants to decorate the sanctuary. But I can remember Isabel getting up early on Sabbath morning, going out with her scissors, and cutting the prettiest roses she could bring to church. It was her way of serving her Lord. Now my daughter Tammy, seems to have inherited her grandmother's green thumb. And even as a child, she used to drag clumps of moss home, stick them in a dish of water, and wait for them to grow. I threw them out usually a week later. But she had the intention back then, and since she has become an avid gardener. After my girls were grown and busy with their lives, I developed a new interest in growing things. I recognized my inability to garden, so I turned to brightening my home with greenery. I started out small, just a little four inch pot or two, usually purchased from Lowe's on one of Billy's frequent trips to his favorite story, store. I discovered a section of the store that sold damaged plants. Many of these plants became a challenge to me. Since Billy was dragging me to Lowe's practically every day, I told him if I had to go there, I was gonna buy a plant, and I did. 
And so my quest to rescue the unloved and forgotten greenery began. The manager of the plant section suggested I might want to get a job there since I was there every day anyway. Now, not every rescue thrived under my watch, but the vast majority responded positively to pruning, proper watering, and sometimes repotting. It delighted me to see these unloved and forlorn specimens respond to a little attention. Now, I really don't sing or talk to my plants, but I do try to find out how to care for each specimen. One size definitely doesn't fit all. I study to find the needs of each individual plant and attempt to provide the best growing conditions that I can. Now my spider plants need a lot of water because they've got all those babies that are cascading down. But my ZZ plants store water in their roots, and they don't need much watering. In fact, don't dare water them during the winter. Now, philodendrons are kind of fussy, and they seem to want you to leave them alone most of the time until they're really, really thirsty, and then you've got to water them from the bottom. One of my first rescues was a sad-looking philodendron that I didn't hold much hope out for. It was about that big. But with pruning and babying it and not overwatering it, it has grown into a plant this size. I really intended to have all the pictures of my plants, but I couldn't figure out how to get them off my phone onto my computer. Some plants thrive with lots of sunshine and others will burn if they get too much sun. It's been a challenge to discover how to care for each individual plant find out where they're coming from, how to make them happy. And I've acquired a pretty extensive collection of greenery, so much so that I've had to slow down my collecting considerably. I'm running out of room. Actually, I can sometimes walk into Lowe's now and not come out with a plant or two. I do have to go look. I don't, they don't have a rescue section anymore, which is quite disappointing. But I still have to take a trip to Wigger's Greenhouse just to see what they've got. As I was sitting on my porch with my puppy, thinking of watching my birds happily feeding at my feeders and enjoying my hanging baskets, it struck me that this could be a lesson to be learned from this hobby of mine. Our church is in the business of soul winning, not of rescuing plants, but people, the only reason we exist is to bring our fellow man into a knowledge of a loving and gracious Savior. Amen. However, with, as if by, with by houseplants, soul winning is not one size fits all. If we want to reach people for Christ, we must learn where they're coming from, find out their needs, Recognize that we're all different and we must use different approaches to suit the individual. I fear that we're also often anxious to bombard people with the truth that we fail to take into account their backgrounds, their needs, and their concerns. We're so anxious to make people believe as we do that we fail to remember that Christ didn't teach the people until he had healed their diseases and helped them in practical ways. And he loved them. It's like preparing the soil before you plant the seeds. Now Tammy, as I say, has her grandmother's green thumb. She told me that you need to spend two or three times more money on amendments, fertilizer, cow manure, and other gross stuff to your garden soil than you do on purchasing the plants. The proper foundation is essential for a good yield. Be it in a large garden or a potted plant, it's different strokes, strokes for different folks. Another of Elder Estep's poems that I love is entitled The Harvest. A farmer prepares for his harvest. He prepares the soil for his seeds. He keeps his mind on his harvest. 
he cultivates waters and weeds. He knows the value of honest toil and looks for a harvest from the soil. A Christian prepares for his harvest. The soil he too must prepare. But how can he hope for a harvest by merely engaging in prayer? A Christian prepares for his harvest ere he sows the truth in the soil. And work, he waters and feeds and follows through and works till he's reached his goal. Thus prayer and work and work and prayer will bring a harvest anywhere. I dare say that each one of us has followed an individual path in coming to Christ. You may have been raised in the church as I was, or brought in through evangelistic meetings, Christian literatures, or through a friend. Each person has a special journey in their Christian world, walk, and we need to realize that everybody's different and has different needs. I find this to be particularly true when it comes to our young people. Not every young person who comes through our doors has had the benefit of Christian education or even the benefit of a Christian home. And believe me, I'm an advocate of Christian ed education. I've been very thankful that my girls were able to attend church school, as imperfect as it might have been at times, and Christian academies. But we need somewhere, somehow, to find an avenue to make our church more appealing to our youth. Many of the young people today are very different than we were as youth. I'm thankful I grew up the time I did. Life was so much less complicated. I know there were issues of drugs down in Washington, D.C. I grew up to co Park, Maryland, right across the line and other temptations, but they weren't widespread. The big scandals of the day were pretty tame by today's standards. Maybe so-and-so was caught smoking a cigarette behind the school. Or did you know that this girl was caught kissing behind the door? And my boyfriend actually got called in on the carpet by the principal because he saw us holding hands in the hall. I mean, we had some real wickedness back in those days. We were raised in a very innocent age. Things were more simple then. I realized I was raised in a somewhat insulated environment. I did what my parents and grandparents expected of me and stayed out of trouble. Sadly, growing up in this environment, the Adventist church seemed, at least to me, to be insulated from the rest of the world. There were Adventists and then there were outsiders. And we didn't mix that much. However, my best friends were a Baptist girl and a Catholic girl, and we played together and didn't mix religion much. I did bring up the Sabbath question to my Catholic friend once, but we most respected one another and didn't let our differences divide us. After Academy graduation, I immediately went to work for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, so I was still pretty much insulated from the world. It wasn't until I moved away from Tacoma Park and went to work outside of the church that I began to realize that we're not the only people who love Jesus. And there are many folks out there who love and serve the Lord devotedly. My nine months of piano lessons opened many doors for me in meeting and learning to appreciate other churches. Because I worshiped on Saturday, I became a pretty popular substitute pianist or organist for several of the local Sunday churches and learned to appreciate the dedication of these outsiders. Actually, I hate the word outsiders. What right do we have to judge people who may think differently than we do? If we want to evangelize, we need to learn to appreciate where people are coming from what needs they may have, and how we can help them learn more about Jesus and his love. And we can talk until we're blue in the face, but the way you live your life is what people will remember. Getting older gives you a different perception on things, perspective on things. I've lived 82 years and have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. 
and I love them all fiercely. But do we have the same backgrounds, the same interests, the same goals? Not necessarily. As a teenager on Saturday nights, if I didn't have a date, which truthfully was most of the time, we'd all gather around our black and white TV in Grandma's living room to watch Lars Welk. It was my grandparents' favorite program. And I enjoyed it too, though not as much as they did. Since I played the accordion, I particularly looked forward to hearing Myron Florin perform. Some of you probably never heard of him. And I watched the Lennon sisters grow up before my eyes. Once I was married and had children of my own, Lawrence Welk was in reruns on educational TV. And we watched it quite a bit. I don't think my girls were too excited about it. But there wasn't that much to watch on TV in the 60s anyway, besides hee-haw. <laughs> As they grew older, their taste in music definitely wasn't something I enjoyed. But I tried to be tolerant, and I even took Missy to a Sean Cassidy concert for her 13th birthday. And you know some, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Lawrence Welk was still around when I had grandchildren, and they considered it torture to have to sit through that program when visiting Grandma Carol Lee. Their idea of good music was definitely different from mine, and it took a while for me to learn to appreciate what music was special to them. But I've learned to appreciate much of their music, especially some of the newer praise songs. It's not what I was brought up with. But the messages of praise are wonderful if you'll just listen to the words. And it's so refreshing to watch young people wanting to spend their time praising God in their own way, even with guitars and drums. When I started my music, the Advent Heralds, a long time ago, back in the early 70s, we had a singing group, you know, back in the polyester age, we had the long granny dresses that never wore out. And we went to a couple of different churches and sang, we weren't all that good, but we were enthusiastic. Anyway, one of the young men there, he was younger than I was, gave me a record with some new music on it for me to consider. It was very upbeat with guitar and drums and very catchy, actually. And I remember telling him, well, it's nice, but I don't think we'd ever play it in church. Guitars? <laughs> well, I changed my mind. And before long, we had guitars with our group. And you can see that we've embraced guitar music with Brian. And you know, to be perfectly honest, I thoroughly enjoyed the drum number with his son one Christmas with the little drummer boy. Music is an individual thing. I know that it, the guitar is appropriate for church now, but way back then I wasn't so sure. And even drums can enhance the worship period experience for people. We've got to adapt to where people are. We've got to accept the way they worship. I can remember one year, many years ago, we had a school, a church school, called Triangle School. And sometimes we'd have visiting groups. And one that I remember the most was a bunch of people with what looked like trash cans beating on them. They were kettle drums. And they had the most beautiful music. It was something I would never have thought of. They were from some country that worship that way, but it was, it was a beautiful form of worship. The point I'm getting at, or trying to get at, is that we need to adapt, appreciate, and be more tolerant of our differences. If we're going to reach people, we need to find common ground and work from there. My husband can't stand some of the music that I enjoy, such as classical and orchestral praise music. And quite honestly, there's only so much of his music that I can take. But we tolerate each other and embrace what we do to enjoy together. We're very different, 
but we've made it last for 62 years. Our youth of today need something to hold on to. They need, they're faced with temptations and decisions that people of my generation never even thought about. And we must embrace them, support them, and love them, even when we don't agree with their lifestyle. I was talking with a friend recently who was sending his daughter off to college. And he was saying that one of the things they talked about was suicide. Isn't it awful to think that young people have to consider worrying about suicide? He said that suicide was a growing concern among college-age youth. It's scary when your child leaves home to live in a new environment with lots of pressure. They can become overwhelmed and decide that life isn't worth living. A woman I worked with lost her grandson to suicide a few years ago. A brilliant young man with a wonderful future. It's tragic that anyone would feel alone, so deaf, alone and desperate. And we need to be the kind of people that others can turn to when they need comfort and support. You don't have to agree with somebody to love them. The church needs to be a place where especially our youth and our young adults can feel safe and cherished. No word of criticism should ever be uttered. If we want our kids to do well, we need to lead them by example. Our church and our homes should be places where people feel welcome. We need to realize that like my house plants, each individual needs special attention. We must be that safe place where individuals can land when they're having problems. You don't need to be a preacher or a Bible worker. You just need to be that welcoming person who is willing to get involved. There are lots of rescues out there who just need some love and attention. And they will grow successfully and maybe become a part of our church and maybe not. But if we live our lives in such a way that people are drawn to Jesus through our actions, we will have fulfilled God's plan for our lives. Now, as I've mentioned, I love poetry. And truthfully, in looking through my notes over the years, I could have just sat up here and read poems and we'd have been fine. And I love the internet because sometimes I can remember a snatch of something and find it. And in this particular poem I did, it's a poem by Edgar A. Guest called, I'd Rather See a Sermon. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye's a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example's always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true. But I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I see a deed of kindness, I am eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stays behind just to see if he can help him, then the wish grows strong in me to become as big and thoughtful as I know that friend to be. And all travelers can witness that the best of guides today is not the one who tells them, but the one who shows the way. One good man teaches many. Men believe what they behold. One need of kindness noticed is with 40 that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear. 
for right living speaks a language which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with his eloquence, I'd say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. In her devotional in Heavenly Places, Ellen writes, titled The Most Par Powerful Argument, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Therefore ye are my witnesses with the Lord that I am God. Of all his followers, the Lord says, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. They are my witnesses, my chosen representatives in an apostate world. When we take the name of Christ, we pledge ourselves to represent him. In order for us to be true to our pledge, Christ must become transformed within. The hope of glory. The daily life must become more and more like the Christ life. We must be Christians in deed and in truth. Christ will have nothing to do with pretense. He will welcome to the heavenly courts only those whose Christianity is genuine. The lives of professed Christians who do not live the life of Christ are a mockery to religion. God does not ask us to purchase his favor by any costly sacrifice. He asks only for the service of a humble, contrite heart, which has gladly and thankfully accepted his free gift. The one who received Christ as his personal savior has in his position, possession the salvation provided by Christ. And he is never to forget that he has freely received so he is freely to impart. Do you realize your value in the sight of God? He says, you are laborers together with me. Are you letting your light shine in clear rays to a fallen world? Are you seeking to exercise every faculty and every power which God has given you? You may not be a minister, but you can be a witness. You may not be an eloquent speaker, but you can be eloquent in letting your light shine before men. A true, lovable Christian is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Bible truth. Such a man is God's representative. His life is the most convincing evidence that can be borne to the power of divine grace. When God's people bring the righteousness of Christ into the daily life, sinners will be converted and victories over the enemy will be successful. Now I have one sibling, a younger brother. I've often said he was lucky I let him grow up. He tormented me as a child. He knew I would yell if, if he put his foot in my room. So of course, he would, and I would yell. But you know, we grew up, we grow older, and I'm very proud of my baby brother. He is a protost at Bloomington University, which is another word for executive vice president, and he's devoted his life to teaching young people. Now, in his younger days, he was a professor of biology and he would take his students on these field trips. His specialty was iguanas. Now why anybody would care about those ugly lizards is beyond me, but Ronnie was fascinated by them. He even has a chapter in a book this thick with no pictures all about them. Well, on one of his trips to some rock somewhere, I mean, he would, he, he would go off on these islands in the Caribbean and take blood samples off of iguanas to try and figure out which iguanas were mating with other iguanas. Who cares? But anyway, <laughs> the sex life of iguanas never did much for me. But he wrote a whole chapter about it. 
But anyhow, often on these trips, it wasn't just the Adventists from Loma Linda that were on these journeys. There were professors from all of these other universities that were in Doguadas. So on one particular trip, I don't know, it might have been to the island of Darwin. He was on an extended trip where they were living on this rock with all these iguanas and these big sea lions that farted all the time. <laughs> Excuse me. Ronnie said they were quite obnoxious, but to get to the iguanas, you had to put up with the sea lions. Anyway, they were not all Adventists on this group. There were a number of non-Christians who went on these groups, and they were all had their own little special areas of expertise. I always said Ronnie was my personal Indiana Jones. Now, Ronnie is not a confrontational person, and he would never push religion down somebody's throat. But he is a dedicated Christian who lives his religion. So on Sabbaths on these rocks in the middle of nowhere, he would quietly disappear to some remote spot with his Bible to spend the Sabbath hours while his colleagues were doing their thing. Anyway, one of the scientists was curious about what was Ronnie doing and took him aside to ask, you know, what are, you do what are your beliefs? Well, to make a long story short, several years later, Ronnie and a couple of the other Adventist scientists took this non-Christian out to this island and quietly baptized him in the waters there. Expi inspiring, isn't it? Ron didn't have to preach to him. But by quietly following his beliefs and showing what God had done in his life, he was a witness. We just need to care. Not necessarily with the goal of baptizing somebody, but with the goal of showing God's love through you. And God's time, I believe that many of those we have befriended and loved and shared our faith with and sent literature to will decide to join us in worship. But you know, that's not up to me. That's up to God. As I was thinking about this talk today, I came across a song by Steve Green that caught my attention. When Billy and I aren't at Lowe's, we're at the thrift store. Pittsburgh doesn't have a whole lot of shopping. Billy will go look at tools, and I look at CDs. And I found a CD that had some songs on it that I liked. And this song was not one of them. But I listen to my music when I'm in the car by myself, and Billy doesn't have to listen to it. And this particular song caught my attention when I was listening to it. And I've fallen in love with it. You ever have something that sticks in your brain and you can't get rid of it and it goes and goes and goes and goes? Well, the chorus of the song has been doing that to me lately. And it seems to fit in with my remarks. So I'd like to close with this, with the words. It's called, Find Us Faithful. We're pilgrims on the journey of a narrow road. And those who've gone before us line the way. Cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. O oh, may who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion find light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may come, those who come behind us find us faithful. Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race, not only for the prize, but as those who've gone before us, let us leave to those behind us the heritage of faithfulness passed on through godly lives. After all our hopes and dreams have come and gone, 
and our children sift through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the memories they uncover become the light that leads them to the road we each must find. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. My hope that, is each, that each one of us will make a new commitment to live our lives in such a way each day that those who come in contact with us will find their lives to be, our lives to be a living witness of Christ's love. Let us be that safe landing place for folks needing comfort, support, and encouragement. May all who come behind us find us faithful. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for the path you have given us to follow you. Please help us to be faithful representatives of your love. May our witness be what you would have us to do. Dear Jesus, please bless the food that we're about to partake of and help us to have a wonderful Sabbath day. Amen.